And just where do you think you're going? <laughs> Come back here. Come back here. The Lord wants you to stay. Come back here. Stop! He then! Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. What can I do for the encore? Old time religion. Give me that old time religion. Give me that old time all right, one more time, give me that old time religion and hit it. Give me that old time religion, give me that old time religion, give me that old time religion, it's good enough for me. Choir, are you ready? Patsy, are you ready? Ready! Then hit it. Good morning. morning. It's great to see you here in the Lord's house this morning. Let's open with a word of prayer. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we do thank you for the day you have given us that we can join each other in fellowship in your house, Lord. May you give me as the pastor the words to say to bring enlightenment to these people who have been so faithful to your word. And Lord, just have your hand of blessing upon us at this time. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We're going to sing two verses of a song, Take the Name of Jesus With You. Take the name of Jesus with you. 
child of sorrow and of woe. It will joy and comfort give you. Take it there where'er you go. Precious name, oh how sweet. Hope of earth and joy of heaven. Precious name, oh how sweet. Hope of earth and joy of heaven. At the name of Jesus bowing, when in heaven we shall meet, King of kings will gladly crown him when our journey is complete. Precious name, oh how sweet. Hope of earth and joy of heaven, precious name, oh how sweet, hope of earth and joy of heaven. Amen. Thank you very much. That was great. I changed things around slightly. Uh, we're going to have our unison reading before our lesson because our unison reading is the lesson this morning. In fact, does everyone have a bulletin? If not, we'll get one to you. I want everybody to see the verses because normally the uh, unison reading reflects the lesson, but today we're going to need to uh, keep on the same page. So that's why it's important you have a bulletin this morning. But this time I'm going to ask Brother John Ruby to come forward and to lead us in the unison reading. Please stand if you're able. This reading comes from Matthew chapter 5. It is part of uh, Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. But let your communication be, yea, yea, nay, nay, for whatsoever is more than these cometh of the evil. Ye have heard that it hath said, for an eye for an eye, and a tooth for a tooth. But I say unto you, that ye resist not evil, but who shall smite thee on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. And if any man will sue thee at the law, and take away thy coat, let him have thy cloak also. May the Lord add his blessing with the reading of his word, and you may be seated. More often than you might think, I get into a conversation with somebody, and the conversation will involve either somebody doing me wrong, or somebody doing this other person wrong, and the other person will say something to the effect of, well, what can we do? We're Christians. I guess we have to take our abuse lying down. After all, Jesus tells us that we are to turn the other cheek. Mwah, 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 mwah. And that's the end of it. Now, the other person who says this to me is not wrong. In his famous Sermon on the Mount, Jesus does tell his listeners, Whosoever shall smite thee on thy right cheek, turn to him the other also. And I dare say that an overwhelmingly uh, overwhelming majority of people hold that in saying this Jesus is commanding that we Christians be doormats punching bags and victims when others abuse us we Christians are not just commanded to look the other way we are also commanded to take the abuse willingly and not we're not to fight back and we're also to invite more abuse upon ourselves without objection or recourse let me paint the picture for you I, a Christian, am just innocently minding my own business when an unprovoked aggressor, let's say it's John here, comes up and slaps me on my right cheek. Now wanting to be obedient to what the Lord commands, Jesus tells me to bravely turn to him my left cheek and let John whack me once again. Now, first let me say, if this is the correct interpretation of this, of this passage, then if the Lord truly wants me to be slapped around for the cause of Christ, I will do my best to oblige. He bled and died for me on the cross. I, I would hope at the very least I'd be willing to have two bruised cheeks for him. But the problem with accepting this passive interpretation of turning the other cheek is that it contradicts other passages in the Bible in fact, in accepting this as the correct interpretation, Jesus would be contradicting himself. In the very same book, the book of Matthew, chapter 18, Jesus tells us that if we have ought against our brother, we're not to take the situation lying down. 
We're not to be, take it passively. We are to instead proactively go to our brother and hash things out. I'm to go to my brother, explain his fault to him, so that he and I can make things right, so that our friendship may be restored. In fact, taking an aggressive approach to the problem is really the only way he and I can ever bring about forgiveness. The passive interpretation of turning the other cheek also contradicts God's commandments way back in Exodus 21 and Levit Leviticus 24, which tells us an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. In fact, they're mentioned in the New Testament as well. And these old passages tell us that if, if someone resentfully, purposefully, or hatefully damages my eye, I have every right to expect that the courts, the judge, to damage the eye of my aggressor. Tooth for tooth, same thing. If someone wrongfully, willfully, purposely knocks out one of my teeth, I can expect the courts to knock out my assailant's tooth as well. Well, as you've probably guessed that I have an opposing interpretation of this whole turn the other cheek topic, and to support my opposing view, we need to study all the parts of this, uh, of this same passage, not just that one verse, not just verse 39. For our convenience this morning, I have included most of this passage in our unison reading this morning, but we have to begin with verse number 37. If you want to watch me, that's fine. If you want to look to make sure that I'm not just full of baloney, uh, you can look at your bulletin. I won't be offended at that. Verse 37 says, But let your communication be yea, yea, nay, nay, for whatsoever is more than these cometh of evil. Now right away we have a problem. We have a possible inconsistency. Jesus commands us only to say yea or nay. If we say any more, we are committing evil. We are sinning. But right here in his Sermon on the Mount, Jesus is saying a whole lot more than just yea or nay. Is Jesus committing evil? Well, of course not. Jesus can't commit evil. When Nicodemus came to Jesus by night and asked how he might be saved, Jesus didn't just say yea, nay. Jesus instead explains to Nicodemus using many words that Nicodemus must be born again. The same goes for the Pharisees and the disciples. When they would ask Jesus a question, he wouldn't just, just directly answer them with a curt yea or an abrupt nay. He would instead give them a parable and then very often give them the explanation to that parable. Again, I, again I ask, not by, by not giving a direct answer like yea or nay, is Jesus sinning? Of course not then we must assume that Jesus is talking about saying yea or nay in a specific circumstance. And under these special circumstances, we are only to say yea or nay. Do you know what verse 37 reminds me of? It reminds me very much of Judge Judy. If you've ever watched Judge Judy, she very often have to, has to insist on a yes or no answer. It's just like, sir, sir. The answer is either yes or no. Was your dog on a leash when it bit the plaintiff? Yes or no? And Judge Judy gets so frustrated when people try to puff up their answer, when they try to reason away or explain away their guilt. Just answer yes or no. But of course, Judge Judy can get away with talking like this because after all, she is a judge in a court of law. Hey, wait a minute. I saw something about law in this passage. Yeah, look at verse 40. There it is. It says, If any man will sue thee at the law and take away thy coat, let him have thy cloak also. Well, that's sad. Poor guy. He lost his coat. And Jesus says to give him his cloak also. This guy, the, the judge here, made the judge of this court made this guy surrender his coat. Now, wait a minute. That means... If the guy lost his coat, that means the guy lost his case. That means the judge must have found this fellow guilty. Well, guilty, well, that changes everything, doesn't it? Let's get back to the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus isn't talking to his followers, assuming that they're all innocent. No, he's talking to them, proceeding from the assumption that they are guilty, guilty of breaking the law. To what particular law is Jesus referring? Well, it's in verse 38. It says, uh, you have heard it been said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. Now look at verse 39. Jesus says, continues to say, but I say unto you that ye resist not evil, but whosoever shall smite thee on thy right cheek, turn to him the other also. You see, Jesus is not talking to his listeners as innocent victims. 
He's addressing them as lawbreakers. Oh, sure, they're his followers, and sure, they want to strive to do what's right, but even we, his followers, sometimes break the law. Let me say this again. I believe, and you may disagree with me, Jesus Christ is not talking to his followers as if they're innocent. Jesus is talking to his followers, proceeding from the correct assumption that they're all guilty. Guilty of sin, guilty of breaking the law. Which law in particular? An eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. When Jesus says to turn the other cheek, he's not talking to the slappy. He's talking to the slapper. The command to turn the other cheek is, to, is not to the victim, it's to the villain. Let me demonstrate this for you. Simply put, in court I am found guilty of slapping John. According to the law of Moses, John gets to slap me back. And after John slaps me, my debt is paid in full. I slapped him, he slapped me, and everything's done. I am free to go. But as a Christian, I need to be better than your average lawbreaker. For goodness sakes, I knew better than to go around slapping innocent John. If I am truly sorry, if I'm truly repentant, then I need to show John how truly sorry I am. So I'm going to turn my other cheek and allow John to slap me again. In short, even though the law only requires me to pay my penalty once, I am willingly going to pay my debt twice. This way of dealing with crimes, with my crimes, will allow my victim to much sooner forgive me, the assailant. This is a godly way of settling things. Let me put this in a scenario in dollars and cents. If I steal uh, $50 from Vivian, and Judge Judy orders me to, well, you got to pay that $50 back. So I do. And after I do, Vivian's made whole. She's restored. In the end, she's out nothing. But she may still have bitter feelings against me for inconveniencing her in the first place. But instead of giving her $50, if I give her $100, when the court only orders me to pay back the 50 I stole, then she can more easily forgive me because she knows I must be truly sorry because I went the extra mile. I went over and above what my punishment was dictated at to prove how sorry I am that I trespassed against Vivian. Who knows? After her money has been restored to her twofold and she has forgiven me of my trespass, she and I may even become friends. Now isn't that Christ-like? To forgive, forget, and forge a renewed friendship. You see, ladies and gentlemen, Jesus wasn't contradicting or overturning God's law of an eye for an eye or a tooth for a tooth, as many Christians interpret. He wasn't countermanding the law. He was enhancing it. Throughout the Bible, the Jewish rulers uh, found it self-gratifying that they held to the letter of the law. But Jesus is saying simply holding to the letter of the law is not good enough for his Christians, for his followers. We are Christians. We are to go over and above. We need to go the second mile. We are to be the salt of the earth. It is not enough for us just to do the bare minimum. We are to strive to be better than that. After all, we are God's children. Any garden variety heathen can pay a fine. Any garden variety heathen can pay a penalty and complain about it later. But a Christian is supposed to be different. A Christian, a Christian is forgiven. A Christian knows the cost of sin. A Christian has a conscience. A Christian turns his cheek and allows himself to be slapped twice, not because he's a doormat, but because he is sorry. He's sorry that he slapped his uh, his friend the first time, if you get what I'm saying. We are commanded to be slapped twice, not to make us into willing victims, but because we're repentant villains. Now, I've, now that I've given you, given you my interpretation of our unison reading, and you're certainly free to disagree with that, most people do, let's read it one more time. Let's read it. You don't have to stand up, but let's read it out loud. And this time as we read it, try to envision yourself in a court setting. Okay? And we'll begin. But let your communication be, yea, yea, nay, nay, for whatsoever is more than these cometh of evil. You have heard it that it hath been said, an eye for an eye, and a tooth for a tooth. But I say unto you that you resist not evil, but whosoever shall smite thee on thy right cheek, turn to him the other also. And if any man will sue thee at the law, and take away thy coat, let him have thy cloak also.
And I don't expect everyone to agree with my interpretation of the, this passage because it is so in the minority it's not even funny. But I hope at least you've allowed me to make my case and you'll take those words and kind of like at least um, consider them, okay? And that's enough of that. I'm sorry about that. We're going to begin again. Take time to be holy. And the verses are in your bulletin this morning. come forward as he leads us in the responsive reading. I, there's not, no reason I picked the responsive reading this morning other than it kind of matches the front of the bulletin. In Genesis we're told in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. In John 1 we're told that in the beginning was the word. And I thought that's a pleasant and a very good thing to be reminded of. So please stand if you're able as brother Bob leads us in this uh, reading. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. In Him was life, and the light was the light of man, and the light shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. That was the true light, which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made by him, and the world knew him not. Amen. Amen. And the Lord his blessing, the reading of his word, you may be seated. One last thing I, I need to announce is I decided to, I don't like to talk about money. There's nothing more gauche than talking about money, and we are in a position, I mean, God's been very good to us, and, uh, and you all have been very faithful in your giving. That being said, I did make a promise that once a month I will just say that uh, we have offering plates. We don't take a formal offering during this uh, time of pandemic, but we do have offering plates in the front and in the back if, you, if the Lord adds... Uh, puts on your heart to give and to tithe as, as a Christian should tithe. And, and you at home, uh, you can uh, send your tithe in, your offering to P.O. Box 84, Norvelt, PA 15674. Okay, I did it. Now you won't hear from the, that again for another month. I'm going to do that once a month. Anyway, let's go on with today's sermon. Uh, several weeks ago, we began a series about the Bible hero Moses. And when we left off last week, the Hebrew people finally had Egypt behind them. The Pharaoh was drowned in the Red Sea. The Hebrew people were finally free and on their way to the promised land of Canaan. All should be good. All should be grateful. And there are many times when everything is good and everyone is grateful. But as soon as any inconvenience any trial, any obstacle arises, we see an uglier side of the Israelites. They complain. And mainly they complain of Moses' supposed incompetence 
and its perceived lack of solid, solid leadership. And these, this isn't with the Israelites, we do this today. As soon as something bad happens, we immediately blame our leaders, who may or may have nothing to do with the bad thing. Anyway, I have a feeling that the people, the Israelites, never quite got over Moses. The fact that he was raised in the Egyptian royal household. And I think they never really overcame that. They're still very jealous of that, but that's just my interpretation. The Israelites very often complain that they do not have enough water to drink. And in their defense, they are, in the, they are trekking through the desert and water would always be on my mind, but God always, always provides them with water. And in the spoiler alert, the 40 years it will take them, them to reach the, Can the land of Canaan, not one Israelite ever dies of thirst. Not one. And yet we constantly, we find them complaining that they are going to die of thirst. We are soon to learn that this lack of faith in the Lord causes the Israelites to take 40 years to make a two-week journey. But we'll get into that. So that's another sermon. We'll get into that in a few weeks. We'll begin this week's sermon in Exodus chapter 17. The Israelites are once again on the move. And they come to a place called Rephidim. And they again complain that they have no water to drink. They begin insisting Moses give them water. They start demanding it of him. Like he's got, like he's got a hose on him. Like, we're like where's this water? Yeah, give us water. Give us water. And the Israelites are so angry at Moses they threaten to stone him. Now, I know if you've had employees, I doubt any of you. Have you ever had employees threaten to kill you? Probably not. Yeah, that's pretty severe. And Moses asks them harshly as to why they're complaining to him and testing the Lord's patience. Moses tries to reassure the people that the Lord didn't bring them into the desert just so that they and their children and their animals could die of thirst. The Lord has a plan, but the people keep losing sight of that. And again, not one Israelite ever dies of thirst. Anyway. Moses, not wanting to be stoned to death, I mean, who would want to be stoned to death, prays to God for an answer. And the Lord tells Moses to take his rod and to strike a certain rock with it. And Moses obeys and water gushes out of this rock for all the people to drink. And Moses does this while the Hebrew elders watch so that the elders may attest that God is using Moses to bring them water. God is an important part of the Israelites' survival. God is trying to send the message that without Moses, you don't have a chance. Even though it's God doing all this stuff, God chose Moses to be God's man in, in, in the deliverance of the, of, the, of the Israelite people. But quenching their thirsts is the least of their problems. While the Israelites are there at Rephidim, the Amalekites stage an attack against them. So Moses tells Joshua, his right-hand man, to get the men ready for battle. They see the Amalekites coming. He says, Joshua, get the men ready for battle. And we can assume that most of the Israelites uh, have no real battle training. They were slaves, not soldiers. So they are outmatched by these trained career soldiers of the Amalekites, who I'm sure are very well armed. Meanwhile, these guys are going into battle with spoons and, and you know, and, and pitchforks. You know, like, like uh, they, they were slaves for that matter. Uh, as a reminder, while the Israelites and the Amalekites are engaged in this battle, the Lord guides Moses to stand on top of a hill to get a clear view of the fighting. And Moses's brother Aaron and a man named Hur, H-U-R, we'll be hearing about him uh, quite often, accompany Moses on top of this hill. And God guides Moses to raise his hands. I don't have any holes, do I? Okay. Raise his hands. And as long as Moses throws his hands in the air like he just don't care, the Amalekites get victory in battle. But when Moses gets tired and his hands start to lower, the Amalekites get the upper hand. I'm no pun intended. Anyway. Now, now at this point in our story, Moses is in his 80s. Now, 80 may be the new 40, but even 40-year-olds get can't hold their hands up indefinitely. So Aaron and Hur sit Moses down on a rock, then each man grabs hold of one of Moses' arms, and they hold it, his arms in the air. And the three men stay on that, that hill in this position until the sun sets, until Israel completely defeats the Amalekites. Now, there's nothing magical about Moses' armpits. There's nothing magical. 
God could have defeated the Amalekites without the use of Moses' arms. It was God who gave the Hebrew soldiers the victory. But he once again was trying to get them to see that Moses is an integral part of his plan for their success. And they keep missing this message. Anyway, moving on. A few weeks later, a f- I mean a few weeks ago, we learned that Moses' wife, Zipporah, was one of the daughters of the priest of Midian. And the Bible gives him two names. One is Ruel and one is Jethro. I'm going to use the word Jethro because I love the Beverly Hillbillies. Anyway. We learn that during the exodus of the Israelites from Egypt, Moses had his wife Zipporah and their two sons stay with Jethro for safety. And while Israel is camped in the desert near near Mount Sinai, Jethro returns Zipporah and their two sons to Moses. And when they arrive, Moses is delighted. He runs and he greets them and Moses is so happy to be reunited with his family finally. He then asks the family into his tent and he tells them everything the Lord has done to protect Israel and to to provide for them. Jethro is so pleased to hear this good news that he begins to praise the Lord and he makes sacrifices to him. Well, the next morning Moses does as he always does. Family or no family, it's a work day. And Moses' job is to sit down at a certain place and he spends his day judging disputes, both uh, great and petty, that have arisen among the people. And the Israelites are constantly bickering. These people are just, they're unsatisfied with God, they're unsatisfied with Moses, they're unsatisfied with each other. And they're constantly bickering among themselves. So they bring their issues to Moses for him to decide who is right and who is wrong. And Moses has to decide whose chicken belongs to who, who is responsible for whose black eye, whose child threw a rock at whose tent. And most, Moses judges these tedious disputes until the, to, uh, from sunrise to sunset each day. Well, when Jethro witnesses that this is his son-in-law's job, he's troubled. And Jep- Jethro reprimands his son-in-law, telling him, He's doing, this is nuts. You're doing way too much. Moses' son and, sons and wife have finally been returned to him, and Moses is spending no time with them whatsoever. Jethro is afraid that Moses will eventually wear himself out, and his people will grow impatient with him. So Jethro advises Moses to appoint and train competent, honest men to judge over these silly, stupid issues. This will allow Moses the freedom to lead the people properly and the freedom to decide more important issues. And Moses obeys his father-in-law. And this becomes the new system of justice. And it seems to work very well. In fact, this isn't temporary. They will, uh, on uh, uh, some form of this form of, of government will happen until they choose a king, King Saul, but that's another sermon. Anyway, pleased with Moses' obedience, Jethro says his good goodbyes and he returns to his home in the land of Canaan. Now, only three months, have, they should have been to prom, the promised land by now. They should have been to the land of Canaan. They should have been there by now. But three months have passed since the Israelites left Egypt. God leads Moses to lead the people to the base of Mount Sinai. They make camp there. And Moses hikes up this mountain to talk to God. It is here that the Lord reminds Moses that he's been taking care of the Israelites just as a mighty eagle carries her young. And God promises that if only the Israelites will faithfully trust in him, the Lord will consider them his special treasure. And after their conversation, Moses goes down the mountain and relates to the elders what the Lord has said. And the people promise, we promise, okay, we'll we'll stop complaining and we'll start obeying the Lord. We'll be better, we'll be different, you'll see. Moses is encouraged by this. And later on, when Moses is again up the mountain, the Lord tells him that he will come to the people in a thick cloud and speak to Moses in front of the people. When the people see Moses, when the people see God speaking directly to Moses from this cloud, then they will certainly know that Moses is God's man and they should just follow Moses. And God tells the people to get ready. God tells Moses to tell the people to get ready. To do so, they must wash their clothes. They must sanctify themselves. They must wash their bodies. And also God tells, God warns Moses to tell the people that they are forbidden to touch uh, any part of the mountain unless they're invited to do so. Anyone who touches the mountain 
without the Lord's permission, will be put to death by either stones or arrows. And this is so severe that you, you're not even allowed to touch the body of someone who's touched the mountain while God is on this mountain. Even if an animal accidentally wanders upon the mountain, that animal must be put to death. Only Moses may go up the mountain, but only after he hears the trumpet sound. So a couple days pass, lightning and thunder can be heard and seen atop of the mountain. A thick cloud covers the mountain and a loud trumpet sound is heard. Every, everyone in camp it trembles with fear. Moses leads the people to the foot of the mountain. Moses then speaks to God and God answers him with the sounds of thunder. And the Lord instructs Moses to meet him on top of the mountain. But first, Moses has to warn the people once again, do not cross this line. Do not come any closer to this mountain while God is on this mountain. Also, they're not allowed to, if given the opportunity, Moses warns them, don't even look directly at God or you will die. God has allowed the Hebrew priests to come closer if they've been obedient. And while Moses is on Mount Sinai, God gives him those Ten Commandments we talk so often about to keep the children of Israel in line. I, I, I won't go into them. I'll just name them real quickly. Thou shalt worship no other gods. Thou shalt not make any graven images. Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord in vain. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Honor thy father and thy mother. Thou shalt not kill. Thou shalt not commit adultery. Thou shalt not steal. Thou shalt not bear false witness. Thou shalt not covet. Okay. But besides these Ten Commandments and what is all, very often missed, God also gives Moses instructions on how to build altars for worshiping him, rules on the treatment of prisoners and servants, the punishment for murders and other crimes. He gives him property laws, guidelines for justice and equality among the people, rules for worship feasts. He gives him instructions for building a tabernacle and all the furnishings inside. He gives him instructions for building the Ark of the Covenant, designs for the priest's clothing, instructions on making sacrifices, as well as the qualification and ordination of priests, and directions on how to burn incense, etc., etc. He gives him a bunch of stuff. These laws and instructions are so vast that the Bible begins listing them in Exodus 20 and they do not end until Exodus 31. That's a lot. 11 full chapters. And that doesn't even include their dietary laws uh, and how they're to determine what is clean and what is unclean. That's yet to come, but that's another sermon. We'll get to that in the future. Now, while God is dishing out these commandments to Moses, the people can hear thunder and see smoke and lightning coming from on top of this mountain. The Hebrew people are afraid, and the people agree to these laws, and they promise to obey him because they fear the Lord. And that's not a bad thing, the fear of the Lord. We need to. Moses actually makes several trips up and down Mount Sinai. He would speak to God and then he would come back down and prepare and warn the people of what God has said. And each time Moses leaves, leaves Aaron in charge and Aaron has his buddy Hur, we heard about him before, at his side. And I believe, if I'm counting correctly, I may have this wrong, during Moses' sixth ascent up this mountain, that he is allowed to bring with him Joshua, his right-hand man. But Joshua is not allowed to enter into God's presence, so Joshua makes camp halfway up the mountain. This time, God detains Moses for 40 days. God has a lot to say, as I told you before. And Joshua patiently waits for Moses to return. After the people down at the foot of the mountain, the Israelites, realize that Moses has been on the mountain for a much longer time than he had been before during his other trips, Get this, they ask Aaron to make them a god, small g-o-d, to protect them. Can you imagine? They see the thunder, they see the clouds, they see, they, 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 it was only three months ago that they went through the Red Sea. It was just last week that they, they were getting water from a rock. That's amazing to me. But because Moses was up on the mountain for 40 days, they asked Aaron, his brother, to make them a god to protect them. Here, it even gets worse. Aaron, who was there beside Moses during the plagues, who has seen everything that Moses has seen, who's been, uh, you know, Moses is not his right-hand man, that's Joshua, but certainly his left-hand man and his brother. Aaron, for some reason, agrees. He thinks it's a marvelous idea. He agrees for them to make, he agrees to make an idol to protect them. So he instructs all of them, to, remember when they, before they left Egypt, they asked all their masters for their gold jewelry and all this. They had some gold with them, and the masters just gave them anything they wanted. 
He instructs them to collect all their gold earrings. And I'm sure other gold as well. But you know, there's thousands of them. That's a lot of gold. And the people are excited to comply. Here's our earrings. Look, boom, boom, boom. Here. Aaron has their gold jewelry melted down and forged into a shape of a calf. Now, again, there's thousands of them. This could have been a pretty big, maybe it was a small thing, maybe it was a big thing, I don't know. We foolish humans think that God is impressed by our gold. He is not. You know, in heaven, gold is so plenteous, it's so common, that it's used as road paving material. You do know that. It means nothing to God. Anyhow, the people then begin giving credit they have this golden calf. They begin giving credit to this new God, this golden calf, for delivering them out of the hands of the wicked Egyptians. Can you imagine? It was God through Moses who delivered the people, and Aaron was there. And the golden calf wasn't even forged at that point. How short are their memories, and how brief is their appreciation? So when Aaron sees the people are pleased with their new God, he gets this, builds an altar in front of this idol so the people can offer sacrifices to it. The people then kill some animals to be used for these sacrifices and they kill, and they even kill some to be eaten uh, in a feast to honor their golden god. Everyone then eats and drinks so much they begin to carry on like drunken, bloated, crazy people. They start dancing around naked around this golden calf. Now keep in mind, ladies and gentlemen, these are the same people who are constantly whining and complaining that they have nothing to eat and drink. But somehow they find enough food and drink for this silliness. Isn't that amazing? We have that today. People can't pay their electric bill, but they have enough money for their cigarettes. They, I mean, people have enough money, you know, you have the money anyway. Of course, God being omniscient knows what the people are up to. He's up on the mountain with Moses. He tells Moses that he better hurry down the mountain because his people are acting like fools. They have stopped obeying him, the true God Jehovah. The Lord informs Moses that the people have made themselves a golden idol in the shape of a calf, and they are worshiping it, dancing around naked around it, and offering sacrifices to it. Now Moses knows God wouldn't lie about such a thing, but he can hardly believe it. He just left them 40 days ago and they just promised that they were going to be true to God and obey him. God is so angry that he wants to destroy every last one of the Hebrew people. And God pleads, uh, Moses pleads with the Lord, please change your mind. Don't destroy us. If you do, then the Egyptians will think you just left us go out of their captive, out of their, out of their hold just to kill us in the wilderness. Plus, Lord, remember... You promised Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob that you would make their people so plenteous that they would outnumber the stars in the sky. If you kill us all, you will break your promise. So the Lord changes his mind. But Moses hurries down the mountain with the two flat stones on which he has written his commandments. He meets up with Joshua. Joshua, Moses' right-hand man, has been waiting for Moses on the mountain. When Joshua hears the noise, the noisy shouts of the people worshiping below, he assumes, he hears these screams, and these, he assumes they've been attacked by the Amalekites or another one of their enemies. As Moses gets closer to the camp, he sees the gold idol and everyone dancing naked around it, and this makes Moses so angry that he throws down the commandment stones, I'm not going to do it, and breaks them into pieces at the foot of the mountain. What does Moses do next? It's 10.30. We, it's 11.30. We have to go. You'll have to come back next week and find out. <laughs> Dear Heavenly Father, I do thank you for this wonderful story of Moses. May it inspire us to how mighty you are, how patient you are, and Lord, how you deserve our every worship, our every thought, our every prayer. May we never put false gods ahead of you, and may we just be mindful of your glory, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Please stand if you're able. We'll sing one verse of softly and tenderly, and then we'll be dismissed with prayer. Softly and tenderly, Jesus is calling, calling for you 
and for me. See on the portals, he's waiting and watching, watching for you and for me. Come home, come home, ye who are weary, come home. Earnestly, tenderly, Jesus is calling, calling a sinner, come home. Thank you all for being here today, and I hope you have a blessed week ahead. I'm going to invite Mrs. Star Ackerman to the pulpit to close our service with prayer. Please pray. Heavenly Father, we just come before you, and we're so grateful for the man that fills this pulpit. We're so grateful that he gives us different things to think about, and a different twist to everything that we have learned. Lord, that it, it really lifts your heart to know that we can really come before you and worship you. Lord, we just praise you and thank you for everything that you have done for us. We ask, Lord, that we not be like the Hebrews, that we don't grumble and complain, that we remember to just praise you for everything, every day for the, all the little things and for the big things, Lord. We are grateful. Be with us this week and keep us to remember when we come up against anything, ask what would Jesus do? And let us strive to be more like our Savior. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you very much. You are just...